Wish you all a very good evening. Welcome to SIM Research 2022, and especially this wonderful masterclass number two on reflective research, interlinking classroom teaching and research policy formulation. Gives me a great pleasure to present to you all two very eminent faculty members who are going to share their knowledge, experience with all of us today. Uh, and they're going to contribute to, I hope, hopefully, uh, building up your knowledge base and your capacity for research. Research has become a necessity in our today's world. The economy of a nation is now going to be largely determined by the amount of new knowledge that the country generates. Gone are those days of agricultural economy, gone are those days of industrial economy, gone are, the, are those days of IT or other forms of economy. The future is going to be knowledge-based economy. And the country that manufactures the most amount of new knowledge is going to be the wealthiest country in the world. So research has now become a necessity for all of us. Research that is relevant to the needs of our country is what is more important and that's going to be the focus of our discussion today. And to talk to us about this, we have some very eminent uh, faculty who have joined us. Can I have the first slide, please? I would like to introduce the two very eminent faculty members who are with us today. Uh, and as I said, who are going to share their knowledge with uh, all of us. Dr. Sanjay Zodpe is currently the president of the Public Health Foundation of India, one of the most renowned and respected public health institutes of our country. He is also the uh, distinguished professor of research at the School of Health Sciences at the Symbiosis International University. Uh, he is ranked in the top 2% of the most eminent scientists in the field of public health across the globe, uh, according to the Stanford University, the latest rankings. So he's a very, very eminent researcher and has uh, contributed immensely in the field of public health for our country. He was awarded with the COVID Warrior uh, Award bestowed by the Sri Bhagat Singh Koshyari Honorable Governor of Maharashtra very recently and several, several awards to his credit. So we are very privileged, sir, to have you as one of the faculty members for this wonderful symposium. The second eminent faculty that we have for today's program is Dr. S.K. Singh, who is the professor and head department of survey research and data analytics at the International Institute of Population Sciences. The IIPS is one of the eminent research institutes of our country based in Mumbai that is contributing to various population science related research activities. Dr. S.K. Singh is a PhD from the Banaras Hindu University, one of the oldest universities of our country and has been uh, contributing immensely in the field of HIV estimation uh, he has been a member of the National Working Group of HIV Estimates in India, constituted by the National AIDS Control Organization. So he has been instrumental in developing the estimates for HIV AIDS in our country and the impact that the various interventional activities have been having on, this, on these estimates. He has been a member of the Monitoring and Evaluation Reference Group of the indicator working group constituted by the United Nations program on HIV AIDS uh, during 2013 to 2017. And we are extremely privileged and uh, proud, sir, to have you as one of the faculty members for today. So thank you very much for coming. So with this brief welcome and introduction, I thought I'll just speak for five or 10 minutes, highlighting why we are meeting here today and what is the objective of today's masterclass on reflective research. As I said earlier, research has now become a necessity of our lives. Because if we don't contribute to knowledge generation, we will become a backward economic country. And 
uh, that is what is largely going to drive wealth and power of a nation. Research is, as I said, an absolute necessity for all of us. And the beginning of research always starts from the school that you study, the junior college that you study, and then ultimately the senior college where you uh, get your knowledge base from. Symbiosis International University has largely been uh, recognized as an educational institute imparting knowledge to all its students. However, over the last decade or so, Symbiosis International University has taken a new and an important step of converting this university from an educational institute to a research-based institute, purely because it is an absolute necessity. Students who come to Symbiosis International University need to be taught the basics of how to, how to do research and how to apply that in your day-to-day -day life and in, a, and in your practice wherever you go. So uh, the SIM Research 2022 was designed primarily to sensitize you, to educate you, and to give you all the knowledge base and the skill set that is required in your future life to do research. So that's the whole objective of meeting today. Reflective research has now become a very important aspect of research. Because research has got such a large dimension, uh, how do you choose, how do you decide what kind of research is going to be necessary for us? Finding answers that are important and relevant to our day-to-day -day lives is what reflective research is all about. If your research identifies an important question, and if you find an answer to that question, it is going to have an application in real life practice, then that is the value of doing that research. So reflective research is essentially doing research that is relevant to our current needs. There are so many good examples of how research, uh, the reflective research, is going to uh, be very beneficial for all of us. As students, when you come here to learn, you, you come here to gain knowledge, the knowledge that is already there in books, the knowledge that is already there in the brain of your faculty members, they will all disseminate that knowledge to you and share that knowledge with you. But tomorrow when you look for a job, uh, one of the important aspects that people will look in you is, are you capable of innovation? Do you have the basic fundamental uh, qualities that are required for innovation? Because if you don't, then the knowledge base that you have earned in your uh, university is not largely going to be uh, much useful. If you are somebody who is innovative, who is capable of generating new knowledge, then the value of yours in that organization becomes very high. And therefore, it is important for you to understand the value of uh, doing research. And how to do that research is what we're going to talk about, and how that research is necessary for us to improve the day-to-day -day life of all our uh, Indian citizens. So with this very brav brief uh, introduction, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sanjay Zorpe to tell us about uh, his experiences and his, uh, whatever knowledge he has earned over the years about this concept of reflective research. Uh, and we look forward to your presentation, sir. So following that, we will uh, invite questions from the audience uh, so that uh, whatever questions or queries you have about his presentation that he made, we will address those. And then this will be followed by the subsequent presentation by Dr. S.K. Singh. So may I invite Dr. Sanjay Zodpe to Please come and share his thoughts on this topic. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Saavi, for that generous uh, introduction. Professor S. K. Singh, distinguished faculty members, students, uh, delegates, uh, invited guests. It is indeed a pleasure to be part of this uh, important discourse for the next three days in this campus. Dr. Savi has very clearly 
articulated the need of uh, research and critical relevance and importance of research in the present context. He mentioned about the knowledge economy. And uh, when we say that uh, we would like to see our country progressing on the path of development, it is important for us as a nation to position ourselves contributing to the knowledge generation. And not only in the national, but a global context and all spheres of life. We generally today would focus on health sciences, but the relevance and importance of knowledge goes into all diverse kinds of aspects of our life. What I'm going to do today in next maybe around 15 minutes or so, to deliberate uh, on some of the issues in the context of reflective research, but also linking that to how the challenges in the context of implementation research are there, how translation of research which is distinct and different that reflective research is critical, but related to the policy research, and uh, also how do we actually connect the classroom teaching and education in the context of research. Let me begin in saying that uh, in academics, when we talk about uh, universities and institutions uh, where we are part of, the two important components that we deal with, education and research. And there is clearly a bi-directional relationship between these two engagements and initiatives. And uh, when we work uh, as a faculty in institutions, or as a student also when you are a learner, and when you are, uh, you are a student of certain programs, uh, even a part of this whole learning process, educational process, we should at the back end clearly try to articulate what are the knowledge gaps. As a faculty, like for example, when we teach, we need to reflect on, because we, we contemplate when we teach, like for example, health systems, or we teach like, suppose, tuberculosis as a disease, or when we teach some skills, like for example, quantitative tools or techniques, which we use for research purposes. Whenever we are engaged in education and teaching, it is important for all of us to reflect are there any gaps in this? Because that's how the knowledge generation will progress. Unless we are able to identify what are the knowledge gaps, we will not be able to articulate and design research questions around those knowledge gaps. And while actually engaged in teaching, we do reflect, because otherwise we will not. But as a student, because we have a student's community here, when you actually read textbooks, when you learn about something, you try to develop that ability to ask questions for which there may not be answers, for which there may be answers. But asking questions is very important. Asking questions to ourselves, asking questions to your teachers, asking questions to your peers because that's how we all progress, you know? And asking questions means reflecting, debating, discussing around issues is important. And that's how actually the education connects to the research. Because the research ideas are generated through asking questions. Unless you ask a question, it will not work around. Similarly, when you engage in research, it could be a small piece of research or it could be a very big project that you are doing. You need to see that as a researcher, how do you bring that research to the classroom? How do you, you know, use the learnings from the research when you deliberate into the classrooms for the students? I would give an example. For example, outbreak of uh, the investigation of outbreaks, which is, you know, Raghu is a professor of public health. 
here sitting is infectious diseases when we teach outbreak investigation looking at the epidemics is one of the very important function of public health students i'm just taking one example and in the standard textbook the process of how do you investigate outbreak or how do you investigate any epidemic the stepwise processes are mentioned and you can read those but when you actually engage in outbreak investigation if you as a student or as a researcher or as a public health professional when you do actually that as a public health practice you will see that when you teach outbreak investigation after having conducted couple of outbreaks being investigated by you different the, the whole approach would be different i tell you honestly suppose when you teach epidemiology and there are different epidemiological methods that we use i will just give an example of a case control study that we used to investigate risk factors and also estimate the risk that could be attributable to those factors but when you conduct two three four case control studies on your own you do a research in using case control as a design and then you teach case control study to your students you can see the richness because you are able to actually understand the nuances of actually conducting uh, the the implementing that particular design there are several biases and systematic errors that are involved in conducting any piece of research whether you do it a case control study or a clinical trials or court study or anything you will be able to actually learn about those things when you actually conduct the research and if you conduct a research in either some thematic areas it could be vector borne diseases to tuberculosis to non communicable diseases or related to methods whether you are doing using systematic reviews or case control studies or simple surveys for that matter and then you go back to the classroom you see that your teaching is very rich you can see the difference in a teacher who is conducting research in a particular area and a teacher who is just reading textbooks or references books and he may be a good teacher she may be a good teacher but you can see the difference similarly when you actually teach to the students we also need to use case studies from where these case studies would come these case studies would come from when you do a research or public health practice into the communities and you think that bring to the classroom so the first point that i wanted to mention is that we need to understand the bi directional relationship between the teaching as education and research and you have to see how the knowledge flows and help you to identify knowledge gaps and answer those questions that's number one message that i wanted to give number two message that uh, dr sarvi also mentioned about the reflective research is in crux means what is the need it should be relevant we should not be doing anything which is irrelevant to the current context and from the societal perspective therefore we also say that science is sterile if it lacks the social relevance and social purpose and we continue to say policies would crumble on clay feet if they are not firmly placed on the pedestal of valid science and reflective research gives you therefore two dimensions the dimension of a need you know what is needed currently today and the another dimension of resources which also includes time for that matter and resources could be financial resources resources could be technical or competence for that matter resources could be logistics resources resources could be in the context of time that whether you have a time to do the research or not the best situation could be like for example you have both there is a need of conducting research but also the resources are available for conducting that research so that's a win win situation you don't have to worry too much on that and that should be the ideal situation and scenario whether that you need to undertake research like for example now non communicable diseases are rising like anything you know ncds that we understand or air pollution i came from delhi today morning and uh, 
today's headlines in Delhi newspapers are like Delhi is a gas chamber. You know, if you leave there, the, the all AQIs and all those parameters that you look at it, uh, you can see that the worst situation that we are experiencing, and Delhi is one of the worst polluted city in the world, uh, and that's not good. So air pollution point of view, and just to give the, uh, you know, the relationship of air pollution with our health, uh, it's more than 1.6 million premature deaths every year in India are attributed to the air pollution. It's 49, 40, 46 million disability adjusted life years are attributed to the air pollution. Huge impact on health, but it also impacts economy. That we estimated a couple of years back, the impact of air pollution on our economy is close to 0.5% of our GDP. So the air pollution is a problem. And now the research is in, into the air pollution as a problem is so critical and important. So from the reflective research point of view, it is very much needed today that how do we resolve the problem? How do we resolve, how do we find solution to the problem? And it is completely multidimensional. As you know, like Dr. Sarvi as a respiratory physician, would deal with the patient who are suffering with COPD where you know air pollution has contributed to. But prevention and control of air pollution is beyond the health sector. You need strategy which is beyond health sector. You need multi-dimensional, multidisciplinary, and multi-sectoral interventions to deal with the air pollution as a problem. Of course, once you are actually exposed to the air pollution and then you develop respiratory problems and then you go to the respiratory physician and then we have to deal with that. But the point that I am trying to make is that air pollution as a condition is, is basically is the current need that we need to find a solution to the problem. The another aspect of reflective research is that agreed that we need to respond to this challenge, but do we have now the resources to deal with it? You know, resources in terms of logistics, suppose you wanted to conduct a research on air pollution, then you need logistic resources, you need research ecosystem in the institutions, you need time to do that, you need financial resources to do that. That's another dimension, basically. When both are available, that air pollution we recognize as an important problem, and we also reflect and say that, yes, we have resources to do that, that's the best situation. But there could be other situations. Let need is there, but resources may not be there. Even taking an example of air pollution, which is an important problem, but we may not have resources to conduct the research. Or sometimes we are confronted with a situation that we have ample of resources available, but we are not able to articulate the need of doing research in a particular area. And that could be a, there could be a fourth situation where something is not at all required, and even the sources are not there to do that. So this this actually a you know four-dimensional way of looking at whether the problem is needs to be solved in the context of whether it's a socially relevant and it has you know needs to be looked up to, and whether we have resources to do that is the another issue of reflective research. So look at reflective research from this two dimensions point of view, whether we need to really reflect as a need on that and from the resources point of view, which also includes the time. The third important point that I wanted to mention is related to the, the models, the different kind of models, because we, we work in the universities and the 21st century universities or academic institutions needs to be research driven institutions. They need to be research-driven universities. Traditionally and conventionally, what is reflected and thought about is that universities are the centers of disseminating knowledge. That you know, the professors would come and train students, they will disseminate knowledge, they will transfer the knowledge. But as mentioned by Professor Sarvi also in the, you know, his introductory remarks, that universities are expected to play a very critical role in knowledge generation also. And therefore, research becomes a very integral part of uh, the whole ecosystem that we have. As a student, because you have several students, your first exposure to the research is that you would be doing research for your project work. That's just a humble beginning of exposure and in the world of research. The first time that even when we did our 
master's program and when I was doing my MD, my first exposure to the research was that for the thesis purpose, for a dissertation purpose, that we identify a small research question and then we try to answer that research question. That's a humble beginning that we all have to do. And as students of any program, that you would be doing certain research in that context. But what I wanted to say is that you understand that requirement of dissertation and thesis is not only the prerequisite for your degree purposes. It is basically to create or you know, to have that attitude and aptitude toward research being developed. And look at from that perspective. We don't expect you to be, you know, any earth-shaking discoveries coming out from the postgraduate research. You identify very simple research question, but focus on learning the whole research spiral. How to articulate a research question, how to ask appropriate questions. Sometimes asking question is more challenging than finding answers. Asking right question is more critical and important than finding solution and answers to the questions. So asking right question, then how do you look at literature? How do you have, <clears throat> how do you decide to identify which kind of design is more appropriate to answer that particular research question? Then actual implementation, and I will talk last leg of my talk on implementation, actually implementing that research, then analyzing data, and then you know drawing correct, appropriate, data-based uh, inferences. Sometimes uh, we have seen wonderful research being carried out and data collected, but the inferences are not relating to what is being reported. So inferences which are based on the data that you have analyzed, and finally then dissemination, writing manuscripts, publishing data, and you know, so that's complete research spiral from identifying research question to actually dissemination in terms of general publications and contributing to the knowledge. That's how the knowledge is created. That's how the knowledge is generated. Because research, mere, research is merely a tool. What ultimately benefits to the society is the knowledge. And knowledge has two components, knowledge generation and knowledge translation. Because knowledge generation that gives as an implementation that we will talk about, you know, you, you are happy that uh, the thrills of discovery, that you publish paper, you do something. But knowledge translation, which is not a part of today's deliberation, but gives you a purpose, the satisfaction of the purpose being fulfilled for that matter. Not getting into the details of that, the point I wanted to mention here is that your exposure to the research begins with some dissertation or thesis. Try to spend time to learn the dynamics of research, which is so critical for all of us to understand as a part of the university and as a part of the education. The last point I wanted to emphasize is about the implementation research or implement issues related to the implementation. Any small piece of research when we actually conduct that research, there are issues involved in actually how do you conduct it, you know, and how do you implement it is more important. Typically, implementation research is in the context of in public health that we talk about in a programmatic context, that, you know, in, you know programs are implemented and how they is happening, how the programs are implemented, which includes the component of sometimes monitoring and evaluation also, trying to, when program research, evaluation research, an integral part of that. When something, some interventions are implemented, how do you design those interventions uh, and then implement into the larger community context to see that whether something works or something does not work. You do a cluster randomized trial of some interventions, some public health interventions. It could be a looking at a resources point of view and economic evaluation of certain interventions that you do. But when you actually design something and you implement, you also have to reflect on the resources that are required, the ecosystem that would be required for that purposes. And uh, the, you know you have to figure it out how it actually contributes to the program and policy. So these are the, some thoughts probably I thought would uh, reflect uh, today. And last point is in the context of, because Gagu was mentioning for a while, the policy research. Research in the context of the policy. Uh, because research has multiple dimensions. Research could be a simple survey to define a disease burden also. Going to the community and see what are the problems. The two simple surveys. Identifying why something is happening in the community. 
what, what went wrong, what are the factors which are contributing. It can analytical research be answered through analytical epidemiology like we conduct case control studies or court studies. But we have to also see that whether some interventions, whether they can work or whether they may not work, and then we do trials and then see in clinical trials or community trials and then see that experiment, through experiments try to see that what is the solution to the problem. So similarly, there could be an evaluation, like programs are implemented. So it's an evaluation research that whether the program is on the right track or not. Similarly, we have in the context of policy, because policies are, it's continuously, you know, shaping and reshaping of the policies to happen. So in that context, the policy of certain, like for example, tuberculosis, the government uh, in as a part of that time RNTCP program, now it's an elimination program, the government was contemplating Central TB Division in the ministry that uh, whether they should uh, switch over to the daily regime strategy for tuberculosis. Now this is a policy change, shift in the policy and that, that needs to be looked at from the research perspective, whether the, the feasibility point of view, the, what could be facilitators, what could be barriers, and so all that kind of research that was carried out is in the context of implementation. So there are multiple dimensions to that when we talk about conducting any piece of uh, uh, research. So uh, these were some thoughts which I, uh, you know, reflected on uh, from the perspective of reflective research and would be happy to respond to uh, some questions if you have any. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Zodpe, for an absolutely brilliant discourse on what is reflective research. He articulated his thoughts so beautifully about why it is necessary to do research, what are the different components of research, and how research needs to be integrated in a university like Symbiosis International University along with the teaching. One fine day, Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree reading a book. And you know what happened, right? An apple fell on his head. What did Isaac Newton do? He asked a question. Why did the apple fall on my head? What would most of us do? <laughs> most of us would eat that apple. Most of us would curse that apple. Why did it fall on my head? It is this mindset that we want to instill among the students who are sitting over here today. Dr. Zodpe mentioned about uh, the air pollution uh, major issue that, every, that the people of Delhi are facing. You know, truly, the quality of air that people in Delhi, the quality of air that people breathe in Delhi is very, very hazardous. We did a study a few years ago looking at the prevalence of asthma in adolescent school children in Delhi versus children who are living in Kottayam and Mysuru, relatively cleaner cities. We found that the prevalence of asthma, sir, in Delhi among adolescent school children using spirometry was 29%. 29% of the children in Delhi showed evidence of asthma. Why is the air quality is so bad in Delhi. One of the reasons is the stubble burning that is happening from Punjab. Now that is an apple that has fallen on the head of the AAP chief minister. Right? It's an apple that has fallen on his head. And he is cursing the apple that has fallen on his head. What we need to do is we need to find an answer. We need to find a solution for the source of air pollution that is happening in Delhi. Is that an important and relevant research question? How can we reduce the levels of air pollution in the city of Delhi? How can we minimize the stubble burning that is so necessary for the farmers in Punjab? Shouldn't this be an important research question for which we should find answers? Isn't it? That's the beginning of research. This is an area, this is a problem that is relevant to the needs of people. And we need to find solutions. Rather than keep on cursing the apples that are falling on our heads, we need to find solutions for that. Now, this is a challenge that I would like to give all the students sitting over here. Can we find solutions for this? How can we stop stubble burning 
in Punjab for that matter. I mean, just think about it. Can we identify a solution? Can we find a solution? That is a win-win situation for everybody, for the farmers of Punjab and for the residents of Delhi. Whatever stubble is left, can I think of a new way of getting rid of the stubble? Can I think of a way where people are desperately wanting the stubble so that they can make use of that for something else? So win-win situation like that is an area that we need to start thinking of answers. Now this is day-to-day -day real life. And in this day-to-day -day real life, we need to start identifying solutions. So this is what reflective research is all about, as Dr. Sanjay Zodpe has very rightly pointed out. This is the mindset that we want to create in your young minds over here. Don't come here only to gain knowledge from the books that you would read or from the knowledge that would be disseminated by your faculty. Learn the nuances of research. Learn the needs of doing research. And how this, whatever you learn over here, will get translated into your future careers in whatever field you go, whatever field you go into. So I think uh, with that, that's an absolutely brilliant presentation, such a wonderful talk. Uh, he talked so many important things. So thank you. May I now invite uh, Dr. Sanjay Singh, sorry, S.K. Singh, to, uh, to share with us his experiences and his knowledge base about reflective research. Dr. Singh, please. Thank you, sir. Dr. Salvi, Dr. Jodpe, faculty colleagues, and students, I will be taking you to slightly different direction. Here I am going to speak on reflective research in the context of strengthening health data ecosystem in the country. Dr. Jodpe has rightly mentioned about two important problems. Dr. Salvi has also raised another problem. I will be not very specific to a particular problem, but definitely I will be focusing on health data ecosystem in the country. Friends, the existing epidemiological transition in the country, coupled with age structural transition, is putting us in a very challenging situation. And we are facing unique health transition which requires change in our health system response, both urban area, rural areas. In one hand, changes in health system response. On the other hand, also providing opportunity for research and intervention in health. What should be newer approaches for us which we should adopt? My background is, I am not a medical professional. By training, I am a statistician. And since last 25 years, I am contributing to Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, in designing, implementing, and producing health system, health data, which is widely used in policy making in the country. Uh, that's known as National Family Health Survey, which is the largest survey in the world. Recently, we have completed National Family Health Survey 5, and currently we are going to launch National Family Health Survey 6. Uh, whatever I will be talking about, research and innovation in health system or health data ecosystem, that basically can be talked in two points of view. We are having a regular routine government data through hospitals, through various MIA system, but we are not looking from that. We are looking from independent, large scale surveys. Specifically, I will be focusing on National Family Health Survey. Where objective is, next please, to promote health data sciences and strengthening data ecosystem in the country on population health, nutrition, and various, okay, development programs, as I have already mentioned to you, that we are doing by adopting seven prone strategies. I am sorry, this slide is looking very dull, very having a lot of information, okay? But somehow, while sending day before yesterday, I didn't change it. These are the seven prone strategies for adopting this. And first one among that is creating competent professional in empirical research and data analytics. Uh, that is not only a statistician and mathematician. Believe me, many health professionals are also 
with the help of artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques by learning some tools from Python. They are also marvelous researchers. They are looking at data analytics, they are looking on health situation in the country in a very variety of perspectives. Second important is generating and disseminating scientific knowledge to policy and programs. In my subsequent slides, you will mention about what are the parliamentary debates, especially based on the whatever I'm talking about that and its fate and how we have influenced so far in my record 32 policies of government of India. And prevention of child marriage act which is pending with parliamentary committee, which has emerged from our most recent National Family Health Survey data. Providing key inputs to policy formulation and informed decision making, around 32 policies. I will not be mentioning about all 32, but definitely you will find a glimpse of those. Evidence for tracking achievement of various programs, goals including sustainable development goals. You may be knowing that out of those 17 goals, 169 targets and 408 indicators, SDG 3 and SDG 5 are directly and indirectly leading towards health. Of course, poverty, hunger, etc. are coming under other SDGs also. But NFHS, whatever data system we are developing, is the key instruments in tracking progress of SDGs. And I'm very delighted to mention you that India, at least in maternal and child health situation, is likely to achieve most of SDG indicator well before 2030. Government has targeted 2030. I will not give the data, like institutional births, SDG for 2030, target is 92%. We are already 89%. If you look at skilled birth attendant, we are around 91%. That's similarly child immunization, child health, reduction in child mortality. On most of indicator, because of after starting NHM in our country from 2005, I will not give much evidence based, but last two slides, I have planned to give you where we are exactly. But I mean to say that our efforts to strengthen health data ecosystem in this country through large scale surveys is very productive. And most of students, even including health professionals who are doing their MPhil PhD digitations are using the data, we are helping them. And that is why it's open. It is already there in public domain. Any one of you who wants to use that, you can use it. Next is collaborating. <coughs> exchanging knowledge with government, civil societies, and other stakeholders. We are having multiple strategies. In one of the slides, I will be talking about that. How we are sharing. Generating information itself is not going to contribute to the development of the nation unless until it is not properly disseminated. And that is why we have been extensively, even Prime Minister also, spared 90 minutes to hear these findings. On 24th, 24th December or November, Indian Constitution Day, I don't remember, it is November or December, when he was speaking on Vigyan Bhavan, I'm not showing the video, but YouTube also, you can look at the video, he devoted three to four minutes to explaining, with, he started with the version, agar nek niyat ke saath koi cheez shuruat kiya jai, to desh ki takdeer and tasveer badalne mein kaise sahayak hoti hai, iska jita jagta udharan National Family Health Survey ki findings hai. That is his first sentence. You can look at YouTube that video. He devoted around 90 minutes because we approached him to release the report. And health minister was interested that honorable prime minister will release. After hearing us for about 90 minutes, he told that, see, these are all academic exercise. He told honorable health minister, neither you are releasing, don't ask me also, these are the academicians. And then our member health, Niti Ayo, he told that he is also from academic background. Let him and secretary health should release along with the team. Uh, that is why it was released. 
Uh, there he devoted 90 minutes. Uh, that is why I am saying that uh, generating information students is not enough unless until those informations are not pro properly disseminated to the policy and program circle. Advocacy to population and health issues through multiple strategies and outreach activities, capacity building and awareness. Now you may thinking that sitting in a grand medical college, how I can enhance awareness of common people in rural areas, common people in the country. But our system, we have developed a system that after every three years, whenever we are going to 700,000 households across, last time we went 707 districts, NFHS 6 we are going to 749 districts. And total sample size is over 700, thousand households, 700,000 households, uh, that's a huge. There, we are providing whatever information we are collecting to them. In order to meet ethical criteria, we are providing them if leaflets, pamphlets, and also providing referral services. I will briefly discuss about that. Yeah, our institution, as a part of the institution, we are under International Institute for Population Sciences under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. We are adopting these two approaches, well-defined policies to promote large-scale surveys undertaken by the institute and developing a strategic support structure and creating an enabling environment to do that. We have completed it despite of COVID pandemic in the second phase of the survey. These are the four. Four prone strategies, which is providing support system and creating a very good enabling environment to be successful in this marathon task. A strategic support structure, we are having research which most of organizations, most of institutions are having those kind of support structure. These are the four most important national level surveys having large scale surveys on health which has given policy orientation and policy research. A most important is the National Family Health Survey, where I am associated, and I will be mostly talking about that. Otherwise, now aging, our aging study has motivated government to change the, convert 175,000 sub-center into health and wellness center with additional services, additional manpower, community health officer, and providing those, creating competent professional, because we are sitting in a university setup right now, competent professional like you, a number of policy-oriented research papers are coming out of this, these surveys and published on basis of data generated through larger scale survey, enhancing eff efficiency and effectiveness of teaching programs under various courses offered by the institute. I am serving to the IIPS since last 30 years. Early 90s, after Cairo conference, we changed our entire family planning related. After NFHS 1 result, we changed to reproductive health, larger. Our teaching course curricula by inviting experts like Sanjay, Dr. Sanjay Jodpe and others from in public health expert, we change into reproductive health. That was early 90s, and most recent, using this database, we have started course on monitoring and evaluation of various intervention program. Before me, Dr. Jodpe was talking about intervention research, he was talking about implementation research. Their major challenge is how to monitor progress in that. Uh, that is why, whether you are a mathematician, a statistician, or health researcher, it becomes very important. And any institution should have this strength that whatever are newer evidences emerging in health system, that should brought within our teaching and research at the possible earliest. And we are doing that. Over 1,000 PhD dissertation nationally and internationally based on data generated by National Family Health Survey. Uh, more than India, UK, US are producing. 
their maximum number of data users who are virtually mapped with the help of satellites, geocodes of all villages of this country. Uh, that's one of the forefront. Whatever data I'm talking, that is called Indian DHS, National Family Health Survey. National Family Health Survey. But over time, we are increasing biological marker as a part of our household survey. And now we are producing diabetes, hypertension, uh, D3, vitamin D3 deficiency, HbA1c, and malaria, anti-malarial parasites, all those in coordination with ICMR. Strengthening training on empirical research and data analytics using artificial intelligence and machine learning. We have been getting support from one US-based organization. Earlier it was ORC Macro. Subsequently it became ICF. And when we were not having even iPhones in our country, right from NFHS3, we started getting support of our, this machine learning methods and our artificial intelligence techniques. Uh, today we are in a situation that we are sitting in Mumbai. Our team is sitting in Mumbai. If an interviewer is interviewing a woman in Arunachal Pradesh, by the end of the day we are having data on our computer. And if 2,000 teams means around 14,000 people are collecting data. Our quality assurance team can access, sitting in Mumbai, which team is collecting what kind of data. Or who is committing some serious error which should be immediately corrected. Our system has developed in such a way. These are the four pillar strategies which we are adopting. All of you might have heard about hunger index, no? Two non-government organizations, one in Sweden and one in Germany, has given some estimate of hunger index, which is beyond our understanding. We have, we understand that. Few days back, I participated in national television debate also on that issue. What are the real problems in those estimates? I, why I am saying to you that generating data is not a problem. Your real challenge is generating health data which is valid and reliable so that policy makers can effectively use it in framing new policy for health and well-being of the people, tracking of various health and wellness program in the country. Uh, that is why we are adopting these four prone strategies. I will not speak about all, but I will definitely constant innovation to ensure data quality to strengthen health data ecosystem in the country. I'm currently heading Department of Survey Research and Data Analytics. This is our responsibility to come up with newer techniques, newer strategies to strengthen our data ecosystem, ensuring good quality data. These are the, some of the innovations which we have done in the recent years. Recent years means in the last 15 years. I have been associated with this exercise right from 98, 99. I will not speak to our medical students what is nested design when a country needs so many things which is not possible. A statistician like me would come forward with these approaches and convince government, let us go for nested design. If you are, any one of you is looking at large scale data, please be careful. What kind of nesting are there in the data? What kind of design has been adopted? What kind of survey weights has been given? Otherwise it will be mistaken. And last these two, I have already speak, spoken to you about the real-time access of data, but these two, developing error message and generating POQR, these are the two artificial intelligence-based applications which we developed at the time of fifth round of NFHS, somewhere in 2018-2019, just prior to COVID. These are our a completely digitized process of getting data. We have moved completely away from paper pencil and gone to computer assisted personal interviews so that sitting in our system we can get it. These are the system that may not be very important for you. Generating error message is an application. We have developed one app through which our team before leaving PSU are assessing 
that on a sample basis, if our if we are visiting 22 households, whatever information is collected, whether there is any implicit error or not. This is one screen giving example of Himachal Pradesh. If relationship between member of a family, if some error is committed, that can be immediately caught and corrected with this example. This is your POQR, Project Officer Query Report. At district level, we are placing our people, whatever data has been collected by five or six teams working in a district, that is collated together, and POQR is run with the help of one login and password, which is given only to our people, not to the agencies who are collecting data. These are the two applications which we are using. And another important issue is the field check tables. Field check tables means what we are doing. Suppose 1,000 teams are working across the country whole day. In the evening when we are looking, around 42 tables we are getting sitting in our office. Those tables are providing us opportunity to look at certain indicators which assess the data quality. Uh, that is why we are, uh, this is our process of strengthening health data ecosystem in the country. Ultimately, sustainable development goal, when we co con completed NFHS 4 in 2015-16, that was giving 28 SDG health indicators. NFHS 5 has given 35, 34 indicator, and NFHS 6, which we have finalized from all preparatory activities and going to the field by January so that before next parliamentary election, we can complete that exercise. We'll have around 40 indicators. Those of you who are aware, SDG 2, SDG 3, SDG 5, all together around 53 SDG health indicators are there around which we are tracking. And out of that, 40 is coming from only one survey, which is National Family Health Survey. And that is why we are giving much importance. Our even earlier data has been extensively used in policy making in this country, initially by Planning Commission and now by Niti Aayog. Even from ninth five-year plan to 12th five-year plan, if you look at plan document of Planning Commission, every chapter of that has a mention of a reference of National Family Health Survey. And then key areas ranges from water aid, etc., hygiene, sanitation, to even banking services. Niti Aayog, right from its inception, has been using our findings for most of global, national, and sub-national level indicator, including multidimensional poverty, SDG for India, and global hunger index. Uh, that is why we have strongly contradicted whatever these two NGOs. Then these findings are also extremely useful in tracking of our SDG progress, which I have already mentioned to you. Portion of VN and Anemia Free India program are going on. Anemia is one of the major challenge, and probably you will have to add in that we social scientists are not our public health expert like Dr. Jodpe will have to. Despite of the program, anemia, reversal of trajectory in anemia, both childhood anemia also and mother's anemia also. What as a social scientist, we have looked at literature. Iron supplementation can only address 45 to 50 percent of anemic anemia in this country. Remaining are either sickle cell disease because nutritional anemia, sickle cell anemia, various kinds of hookworms or genetic factors. And our Anemia Mukt India program probably will have to re-look at its component and domain. Change in direction of India's family planning program. I'm, I think many of our students might not have born at that time when India adopted target-free approach. Many people were mis worried whether we are going to in a wrong direction, but it was the NFHS 1 finding which gave confidence in scientific community, family planning workers, and health officials in this country that, okay, there is no harm. Uh, today it is giving from women's rights point of view, from gender point of view, from all those angles. That target-free approach really helped the country. September 2017, 
women and child development minister uh, when probably that time menka gandhi ji was there she announced the program states gold medal silver medal on nutrition based on nfhs data honorable prime minister started large scale national nutrition mission subsequently portion abhiyan citing the example of national family health survey data which is and then even icds has been intensified based on that uh, i would also categorically like to mention because i was part of that exercise in 2005 country was struggling with estimated and projected hiv cases of around 6 million 5.92 million uh, that was the time fair as a part of national family health survey first time we had community based hiv prevalence and our estimate came to 2.47 million from delhi to geneva everyone was worried we carefully looked at the data looked at the assumption ultimately not only india 10 other country also has to revise the estimates india hiv burden reduced from 5.92 to 2.47 million global hiv burden reduced from 42 million to 37 million 5 million was reduced there also uh, that is the contribution domestic violence act for right and respect of women in the country the parliament has passed two acts uh, those acts 2006 act was passed only after nfhs two results in 98 99 nfhs two results from where i joined the journey of national family health survey that was the first time when country produced valid and reliable estimate on violence against women women's perception many parliamentarians raised the issue in parliament and ultimately this act was passed then 2013 also another act for evidence first ever efforts country to reduce violence against women at workplace these two act has helped a lot in empowerment and rights of women in this country of course discriminatory practices are still there some of the states are talking something i should not go for because we are academician most recent so honorable supreme court on child marriages in india has cited estimates of nfhs 3 and nfhs 4 on sexual violence against young brides okay and that then recently proposed provision of child marriage act 2021 quoted the figure of our nfhs most recent nfhs 5 then from nfhs 5 nfhs 4 i am going back name and same program biodegradable sanitary napkins when we produced nfhs 4 result around 48% of young girls in this country we are not using hygienic method of menstrual protection on 16th sorry 31st march 2016 when i presented this finding to then secretary there itself it was decided let us do something then our women and child development and ministry of health together started a program by giving some contract on subsidized basis to produce low cost biodegradable sanitary napkin and today nfhs 5 result shows that that proportion has reduced to around 20% but even we should eliminate that 20% also if we are concerned about reproductive health of young women in this country addressing their rtis and other kind of reproductive morbidities we will have to completely eliminate safe menstrual hygiene should be prioritized mission parivar vikas in 140 it is not 146 typo error it is 142 districts when we presented nfhs four results government asked that why not to give estimates or tfr we found indirectly that 142 districts were having tfr of above 3 government has started a special program and within 5 years now our tfr has gone below 2 on an average in india a woman is producing two or even less than two children in their entire lifetime by taking 
a very scientific computation on that, uh, that there is no question of doubting that. Then another is aspirational districts, focusing on 115 program. I mean to say that, that this health system data is providing, which we have, our institute has been with ministry producing, has made a tremendous change in policies and programs in the country. And how we are disseminating this knowledge? Basically, five printing and distribution of state reports to all districts of the state, preparation and distribution of national report to all states and UTs, bringing out fact sheet containing key indicator, about 96 indicator, for each districts of the country, and organizing national dissemination for key stakeholders. This, uh, our key fact sheet was released by former health minister, Sri, Dr. Harsh Vardhan. This was not only at national level. We have been doing it even at state level. That's Karnataka. This is Bihar. And then another survey also reported, and Mandiva Sahab also reported this. In parliamentary debate, if you are looking at NFHS five, four findings invited all together, 54 parliamentary debate, parliamentary questions by Honorable Minister, that was answered by Honorable Minister of Health and Family Welfare. Of course, we are also helping him in providing answer to those questions. Key findings of NFHS five, which was released on December 24, 2020 by Honorable Minister of health and raised around 16 questions in both the houses, combined despite of limited functioning of parliament because of COVID pandemic. And last year result has also been pointed out, a debate of welfare of elderly population in this country uh, that has resulted into health and wellness center. Uh, yeah, our strategy for policy advocacy and awareness, I have gone back it seems. Uh, these are the media coverage. Once we are producing one round of data set, around 2,000 media coverage is creating awareness, not only about health professional, social scientists, activists, everyone is looking. Then another is the outreach activities, I categorically mention. When our team is going to 34,000 clusters across the country, 34,000 clusters, at community level, at village pradhan level, at selected household level, we are also providing this kind of brochure. In local language, those brochures printed in local language, uh, that is definitely enhancing people's awareness, people's capacity to understand what is anemia, how anemia is activated, and what may be possible measures. And not only awareness, if some are really severely anemic, by our test, we are also giving referral. And Government of India is already issuing letter before our arrival. Similar situation is blood pressure and diabetes also, not only anemia. And that is why I am saying that our efforts to strengthen data ecosystem, health data ecosystem in the country is enhancing people's awareness also. And nowadays, gradually India is becoming diabetes capital in one hand. Probably we cannot overnight tackle the problem. Our medical colleagues will have, all of you will have to play a key role in that. But we being a social scientist, definitely we are also contributing in enhancing people's awareness, their capacity, by putting this knowledge and these kind of materials. Most recent NFHS we have completed in 707 districts, and the field work was divided in two phases. I have already shown and because of COVID, it was interrupted, the second phase especially. I'm not sharing with you, but definitely today morning I was talking in Mumbai to around 30 officials from eight different ministries and Niti Aayog in my office. There, my presentation was focused at that how our these efforts are able to maintain quality of data. For that, I have taken nutrition data by unit level data, and whatever WHO is standard, plus minus two SD, using kernel density curve and Victoria plot. Unfortunately, 
our medical students might not have studied that, but whoever is from statistics, they may be definitely aware from these two. You can also try. There I have shown them that how there is no deviance. And based on four statistical parameters, I compared NFHS 2, 3, 4, and 5 pre-COVID and 5 post-COVID and shown them that there is no distortion in data quality. For that, we have to spend 7.46 crore additional amount to implement st a special st yeah, yeah, a standard operating procedures across the country. These are the India situation. Look at that. Modern family planning methods, India needs 55.3. Already we have achieved 57. NFHS 4, 15, 16, it was 48 percent. Unmet need of family planning, I am not taking pain to explain it. You can understand very quickly that those who don't want any more children in the next two years or ever in their life, but currently not using any method of contraception. That is 10.5 SDG target. We have come down to nine. 2015-16, it was 13%. It has come down to 9%, OK? Which has lower than whatever is stage target for 2030. That also we have achieved. If we are looking dangerous indicator, percent of women age 15 to 19 who are either pregnant or already become mother. In 15-16, it was 8%, 8.1%. 1921 for India, it has come down to 6.8%. Uh, we will have to bring down to 5.8%. And I hope in next parliament session, our provision of Child Marriage Act should get passed, despite of certain reservations in certain corner. And once we are able to protect child marriages from this country, those 5.5 can be easily achieved. Four plus ANC for entire maternal health, our progress is quite impressive from 51% to 59%. But we will have to go still long away, requirement of 75%. But a state like Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Telangana, five or six larger states are creating real hurdle. Institutional births, look at that. We have already reached 289. SDG target for 2030 is 92%. Skill birth attendant, SDG target for 2030 is 97%. We have already gone 89.4. Similarly, full immunization among children. After two rounds of mission in Rathanus, we are in a quite comfortable situation. That is why we are not much worried about. If you look at ANC coverage, OK, target for 2025 as per health policy, was 90 percent. Uh, we have already received at all India level also uh, as well as 10 states. Okay, skill birth attended 90 percent for 2025. 89.4 we have already. TFR, if you are looking, I mean to say these are the demographic indicators where we are doing very well, and these indicators are really contributing to our Ministry of Health, Niti Aayog and Prime Minister's office in tracking progress of the program, revising program. Thank you. These are the, some of the my perspectives on these issues. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for highlighting the importance of policy driving research that is so very important for our country. Research that helps drive healthcare policy is also a very important component of research that we need to undertake. Uh, so after two such brilliant talks by Dr. Sanjay Zodpia and Dr. S.K. Singh, I'm going to leave this uh, floor open for question answers and discussion. Uh, please make use of the presence of such eminent faculty over here to address some of the concerns, questions, queries that you would like to have answered by them. So I'm, I'm going to invite questions from the audience. And uh, while you are thinking about potential questions that you would like to ask, we are very fortunate to have Honorable Vice Chancellor of MUHS, Dr. Kanitkar, who is present among us over here. And uh, 
very privileged to have you here, ma'am. Just a loud thought, a wild thought, based on what Dr. Sanjay Singh presented. Uh, he also did mention that the National Family Health Survey data has helped uh, generate about 1,000 PhDs in our country so far. Uh, could it be possible, just a wild thought, that the NFHS data, state-wise, can potentially be used by the MUHS to help uh, build capacity amongst our undergraduate students, postgraduate students, amongst the, family, amongst the faculty members to utilize the data that is being generated by NFHS for the state of Maharashtra and then derive useful uh, outputs of that. So this could be a very useful research exercise for our faculty as well as for our students. And that could also contribute to uh, generating reports that could help drive state health policy. So uh, just a wild thought, ma'am, what do you think about this? And Dr. S.K. Singh is already here, so we could potentially start with that discussion. May I have some mics over here, please? So ma'am, uh, thank you for coming for this uh, session. It's uh, such a pl pleasure and a privilege to have you here. We would need to have some mics with the is it with the two faculty speakers as well. Uh, yes, ma'am. Firstly, I missed out on the first part because I was at the inauguration. And I think this is a very important uh, theme that we are talking of, you know, uh, bringing in classroom to research and research to the classroom. Uh, you've made a very important point, and I think it's already happening. I can quote even the publication where my undergrad, as part of his uh, this thing, did a uh, using NFHS data. He showed a close correlation between improvement in sanitation and uh, improvement in stunting. Wow. <laughs> I, and this is a publication. And I think it's a, it was a, one of those really prize winning this things where, but it, it, what is important is for faculty to be sensitized. Because a student will, right from the undergraduate day, tomorrow I'm talking on that. This PhD is like the ultimate. But what research is how to use data when there's someone generating data? Absolutely. How to use that has to be, we take statistics in medical schools as very theoretical lectures. We don't get them to do desktop, tabletop exercises using available data and how to interpret it. I think that is what is important. And on the other side, I mean illustrious people like him who are doing amazing work where there's policy decision. I mean, if it could somewhere percolate down to a small part of the project, you know, when we are collecting data, we are collecting surveys to sensitize students, can we also interlink your institutions with colleges and getting, but we use field workers. Instead of that, can we have students volunteering to take part in this? Thank you, ma'am. It's a very nice suggestion. On February 21st, 2021, our Honorable Minister, he visited our institute because uh, on 21st, on 1st of September, when I presented before going to public domain our results, and he took it to Honorable Prime Minister, he told that I will come to IIPS and know about NFHS. The, he is having charge of fertilizer also. The, he visited RCF also. He visited IAPS also. He devoted around two hours of hearing about NFHS. He also came up exactly with what Madam is saying. <laughs> that instead of hiring 4,000 people, 4,000 investigators across the country, if we can link with, he talked about medical aid student. That's exactly okay. what I said. Yeah. And but I'll share our, an experience. our problem is, our problem. Gujarat Health Secretary, after returning from Harvard training, when we produced NFHS 5 result, she rushed to us. She told that, I don't agree with your estimates for child immunization. Our MIS data is saying that we are above 95%. You are bringing us below 95%. Uh, that is why I am having money. Let us do a survey with the help of medical graduates. I told that our this survey is taking around one year of time. 
survey when we are starting, uh, we are going district by district. Our frame is one team per district. One team per district. It means 727, 707 districts, 707 teams. In one team, there are seven members. And in one district, Madam, we are taking around 50 villages. Each village, our team is going for four days, 200 days. I'll, I'll, your point is well taken. I'll give you an example where at the university level what you've done. We've launched a project, Blossom, to integrate research and medical education and uh, outreach program. It's happening in Nagpur. We are going to do in two months 10,000 population, 18 tribal villages, Adivasis covered. How are we doing it? We have taken all PATHI students, created teams, put one public health specialist as an associate professor, assistant professor, as a team leader, and created the infrastructure for them to go and collect. So now it is teaching students. It is taking from classroom into a practical situation. The students are learning communication skills, interacting. They're getting sensitized to the people, and there is no funding. And it's happening in two months. We are finishing the whole thing. So uh, it's just a thought. OK, what yeah, no, that's a good idea. Raised yeah. that we need to probably interlink. And how can we use our youth? Because then, without taking a lecture in how to do sampling, we, they are, we are using the teachers to teach them in the bus rides while going to the village. We've made this local school, as I'll, I'll, I'm talking about it tomorrow, as to how catching young and what the university is doing. Thank you so much. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you so much for that response. Uh, in addition to building capacity amongst the uh, undergraduate students of Maharashtra, uh, the other point I was making was the such rich quality data that is already being generated how can we utilize that data amongst medical colleges themselves and teach students how to uh, use that data to generate uh, analysis and reports that would be uh, changing, helping change the health, health policy of our state. So I think that's, this is absolutely brilliant. Dr. Sanjay Zodpe, any thoughts on this? As the director of the Public Health Foundation of India, you hold a very high position at a national level. What do you think about these thoughts that have just come out? Uh, thank you, Professor Savi, and uh, this is a very relevant uh, question. What I would say is that, uh, unfortunately, even today, looking at secondary data from the research perspective is uh, lacking amongst academicians and researchers. Still, we focus on primary research, which is important. We all understand the relevance and importance of primary research. but. Uh, even good researchers, you ask a question, the list, the sources of secondary data. How many people are aware about the sources of secondary data, both at global and national level, number one. Number two is that even awareness of data is available, like for example, NSSO data or census data, NMPHS and many sources, multiple sources, both national and global level. Awareness may be there, but how many have a capacity to look at this data at the group level and at individual level and then leverage the data for answering their research questions? So that capacity is also quite limited. We have in-house at Public Health Foundation of India that colleagues doing a lot of research using the secondary databases and trying to answer some very important questions both at the national and global level. I think what uh, ma'am probably the university can do is that uh, amongst our faculty members, how do we build a capacity to look at the sources of secondary data, use that data for answering some research questions systematically through uh, some research program or capacity building program. So that could be done PHFI and MUHS can collaborate and uh, we can you know participate and help in doing that capacity building of faculty actually looking at secondary data and analyzing the secondary data and not only the databases uh, Dr. Sarvi like for example uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis you know Absolutely. huge amount of primary research is carried out more than 40,000 
journals related to health sciences published annually, globally. But uh, how much of that primary research can be synthesized using the tools and techniques of meta-analysis and systematic research? Again, the capacity is quite limited. Not that everybody is able to do that. But interested researchers probably can look at those tools and techniques which can also be used for analyzing the secondary data, answering some research questions. That would be useful in advancing the larger, answering some questions in medical research, clinical research, public health also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zodpe. I'm going to now invite some of the faculty members who are sitting here to ask any questions if they have, and also the students sitting behind. I must tell you, you are so lucky to have such wonderful, eminent faculty members over here. Uh, you know, they're emin eminent people of national institutes of repute. The Public Health Foundation of India is very instrumental in generating research that uh, helps, helps drive national policy, and so does the uh, International Institute of Population Sciences. I mean, you have the cream of the cream who are sitting in front of you. So please ask questions and uh, really appreciate, especially all the backbenchers over here, uh, to think about asking questions. In the meantime, any, any, any questions from the faculty or the audience? So uh, while talking about reflective research, I would like to touch base on the regulatory approvals involved in the research. So if a research is a reflective research, uh, will that help the researchers overcome the regulatory approvals? For like example, we saw in COVID that we were getting approvals like, like this because it was the need of the hour. So if you focus on the research related to the need of the hour, Will the approvals be expedited? Both so of any, you can any uh, on put your thoughts on this. No, it's absolutely critical because when you talk about reflective research, you talk about two dimensions, the need and resources. And when you talk about resources, I include even approvals as a part of regulatory, you know, approvals is an integral part of uh, the resources that we talk about. And uh, But I would also like to say that there are, de see, uh, you know, your country, things move slowly. but we are moving in the right direction. There are a lot of reforms happening, both uh, at uh, even Indian Council of Medical Research, regulatory agencies, to see that they facilitate research in the country. Otherwise, like in clinical trials, at times we had experienced certain challenges in, on that front. But because of the component of involvement of the human beings related to the safety issues and other issues, they are more critical and, you know, uh, the decisions are taken uh, after thorough reviews. But I fully agree that uh, you know, we need to have a strategic approach to uh, ensure that the regulatory approvals are expedited so that we can facilitate the research in the country to the extent yeah. possible. Thank you. Thank you for raising that very Thank important you, point. Thank you so my, much. My in my opinion, it's a very co conducive situation in the country for reflective research to be translated into practice. Uh, that's quite conducive. Only regulatory practices and ethical, these two will have to look at that and create a balance between that. Otherwise, it's absolutely fine. Except one example. I'm looking public health experts struggling with FSSAI right now in view of increasing, increasing burden. I am also somewhere in link. That is why I'm getting the message. They have come up with their regulation and open for public up to November 15 to comment on that. That in order to address burden of NCDs in the country, country differently needs put some warning levels on all package and processed food in the country. Uh, that's has two sides of the same coin. Some people are saying that, yeah, it should be star rating, India mm. nutrition star or health star rating. Some people are coming with, no, it's, we should jump to warning levels as we da did in 2003 at the time of Kotpa X and Empower strategies. Uh, that is why I told that I'm having a mixed response on that, but quite conducive in moment. Thank you. But I would say that discourse and debate is critical for advancing science in any society. Absolutely. And so two schools of thought, that's fine, but we must, we must debate uh, and you know, put our arguments to see that science progresses. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Students, yes, please, wonderful, brilliant. Please 
please tell us your name your you're in which class and what is your question Good evening, sir. My Good name evening. is Chetna Vats from MSc Nutrition and Dietetics, SIHS. Sir, I would like to know how can we encourage the acceptability of varied opinions and results in research in student-teacher relationship? Can you please repeat yeah, your sure, question? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I would like to know how can we encourage the varied opinions and uh, results of research in student-teacher relationship? Varied results of research between the students and the faculty. How do we encourage, let there be differences of opinion. of varied opinions. <laughs> That's very difficult to answer <laughs> as an outsider. <laughs> that will vary from institution to institution. Like Madam has already given one agenda. She has told that faculty members should think about Okay, that direction and like Abhay Bang and Rani Bang, whatever they created in Gadchiroli, that's a marvelous exercise here in our country and very good evidence. That is why we encourage whatever Madam is saying, even for implementing at most of medical institutions, by most of medical institutions in the country, where but survey tools should be a smaller enough, okay? You, you have an example to give so that uh, we'll... Uh, not exactly, I'm actually going to post you in the next year, so I'm just wondering. <laughs> no, good, I think it's important to have differences of opinion, yes. uh, but it should be a healthy discussion. I yeah. mean, it shouldn't be one track minded, no, this is the only truth, this cannot be the truth. So both the student and the faculties will have to have pretty open minds to have, to agree to, to disagree. And, and that's, that's how research is driven. I mean, uh, that's the best way to do it. My earlier statement that uh, the discourse and debate is critical in advancing science Absolutely. applies to interaction and discussion between faculty and students also, you know? Yeah. And it's important for the students to debate and discuss with the faculty as well. It's important. You know, many a times the students are right. And, and therefore, you should, I would certainly encourage young students to fight with their faculty teachers <laughs> debate. Unfortunately, uh, if you look at uh, in culture in some universities in western part of the world, uh, you know, interacting with the faculty, asking questions uh, is absolutely encouraged. Unfortunately, in Indian culture, we, because of our Guru Shishya Parampara, many <laughs> other things basically, out of respect at times, we are shy, we are inhibited, of asking questions, but I think, uh, you know, in the current world, uh, uh, if, if there are questions, it needs to be discussed and debated, and arguments are very welcome, and otherwise also, you know, we are labeled as argumentative Indians, and, you know, we need to reflect that way that we should ask questions. <laughs> like May I add, Thank Dr. Zorpe? I think that is also changing what you correctly said, the environment is so conducive today. I mean, uh, me growing as a child, if dad said, come home at seven, you came home at seven. When my husband told my daughter, she said, chill, dad. And her <laughs> child is going to not even ask for it. <laughs> Absolutely right. Thank you for that question. Yes, anybody else? Yes, please. Uh, sir, I'm Zahana from Medical Technology. Usually, I'm doing second year master's in medical technology, sir. What we are facing the problem, issue with the research is thing, we are very interested in doing. From basics itself, we are like in seek of doing and getting knowledge and doing, uh, finding the research gap, everything. But the thing is, what is the motivation for the other students? One or the other student is making his own hard work and he is doing. But what about the motivation for the youth that research is important and we have to do? They are neglecting actually. It's a learning stage and why don't we, why everyone is not able to learn how to do. And also practically it should be thought. It's not just like theory why it has been thought. So we are actually facing in every small, small step of research also. We go in seek of mentors and we go ask them to teach this, teach that. And uh, that is the issue we are all facing actually. No, right you're now. absolutely right. I mean, this is, a, this is a genuine issue that students are facing. I'm so happy that Somebody like you is standing up and asking this as a question. A few years ago, nobody would even stand up and ask these questions because they wouldn't even know that this was important. The fact that the current batch of students are understanding this 
understanding the value of all this is absolutely amazing. So the, there will be a change. There will be a change over a period of time. It is happening. And you know, attending, an organ, uh, attending a conference like Sim Research 2022 is one of the solutions. You're sitting over there. You're listening to some of the national faculties of eminence speak about why, why do research and how to do research. This is educating you all, isn't it? This is at least inspire you all a little, motivate you all to do research. The nitty gritties, yes, I think we need to, we need to have the faculty supporting all this. Uh, I'm sure the faculties are also listening to what you're saying over there. And uh, they will change. They will change over a period of time. Uh, tomorrow you will become a faculty at some institute and you will perhaps be a good role model for how, uh, how to imbibe that spirit of research amongst your students tomorrow. What will the motiv motivational I mean, motto for the students sir, to just, you know, go do the research or anything from your side, sir, because you're all experienced people from <laughs> in the research. So when you tell some motivational speech or something, just give us a motto so that all students get do show interest on the research. Sir. So you want to add see, to that? The, uh, see, the, we, we, we are realizing that we are in the world where it's a knowledge economy. And knowledge generation is so critical for universities also. Traditionally and conventionally, universities played role in knowledge dissemination. But now, uh, now most of the universities are getting transformed as a research-driven universities and institutions also. So impetus and importance to the research is enhancing, and that I would definitely percolate down to the students also, number one. Number two is that uh, we need to recognize that uh, Research is merely a tool. What ultimately benefits to the society is the knowledge, you know? And from that perspective, having basic research aptitude, skills is so critical for everybody. You may not be wanting to have your career in research. You may not be wanting that, you may not be very interested and uh, that I wanted to make you a career, but basic understanding of research, even clinical practice for that matter, you know, is so important because that that uh, inquiry mind is so critical in any field. You don't need to be a, uh, pursuing your career as a researcher also. But asking questions, identifying research uh, designs, uh, solving, drawing inferences is important. So I think the faculty, uh, the students will also have to realize over a period of time that it is not only for research as a career, but these basic skills will help you to be a and in day-to-day -day life also uh, help you in long way to go. And there are many, many now universities, university grants commission, there are different skills, ICMR, like for example, student research fellowship programs. So these are all motivational for the students, you know? These are all efforts to motivate students. Now university has started the initiative, taking students to the community, doing some research, bringing that to the classroom is an effort towards that direction, I would believe. Thank you. My brief answer to your question is, you are growing up in a phase of transforming India. And you are dealing with a subject which is continuously evolving in nature. Health is not a dynamic concept. It is continuously evolving in nature. Epidemiological transition is taking place. Health transition is taking place. That is why your challenges are also continuously evolving in nature. That is why research and intervention are the only solution of this problem. We cannot keep ourselves away from that. Be inquisitive. <coughs> Make observations during your routine day-to-day -day life. Get excited about finding answers for questions that, you've, that, you, that you experience during your day-to-day -day work. Find answers and get a kick out of it. Once you get a kick out of it, you don't need any motivation anymore. You yourself will want to find more and more answers, and then it becomes a self-driven thing. So it's, it's just a mindset that is required. Uh, in the initial stages, the reward comes from inside, and then later on, the rewards will start coming from outside as well. So thank you for asking that question. You want to ask some, something more? No, thank you. Yes. Good evening, sir. Good evening. This is Dr. Pavan Reddy, a student of Masters in Public Health. SHS. Sir, as you asked to think about the air pollution in Delhi, the staple thing. So, 
for the research why can't we go for doing research for reusing the staple like uh, we already know that the rice husk is being used for making furniture from a factory in chennai in the same way without burning it there is a, why can't we take uh, uh, that uh, from it we can produce fibers the staple can be used in producing fibers why can't we do research like that good that's the beginning of research the fact that you are even asking such a question is the beginning of research <coughs> you have so, identified the problem you think that there is a solution that's the beginning of research so if we can think okay. of doing uh, the fibers from the staple that is biodegradable so it will help us to control the air pollution and that will even help uh, to get fibers which are degradable which will e eventually help the control the pollution too good very good very nice i uh, like i think plastic can also be avoided by this way this is exactly as doctor this is reflective research there is a problem for which you are looking at a solution now how do you create that solution is is going to require innovation is going to require uh, you know good scientific thought and and action to conduct that kind of work and then show that it works so this is the beginning of research and i'm glad you at least got inspired and motivated by the fact that uh, this is a perfect example of reflective research could any more questions yes ma'am somebody here i think somebody from here wanted to ask a question or here no anybody else anybody wants to make any comments yes please there's one there behind uh good evening everybody uh, good evening. my name is neha i'm pursuing mba uh, first year shs so my question is to sanjay sir so you mentioned a line uh, that said science is sterile if it lacks social purpose can you throw some more light on this <laughs> thank you i said that uh, science is sterile if it lacks the social relevance and purpose in the context that the science that we see that science we wanted to see it should be useful to the society you know and uh, if something what in the context of research whatever we do need some translation if it is not of any use then what is the use of that uh, research that we conduct so it was in the context of societal use and application whatever we do that how it helps to our own people how it improves health of the people how it actually helps in development so in that context i said that science is sterile if it lacks the social relevance and purpose that's the context you know perfect example Because is what dr sk singh showed the data that he collected the research that he did is driving healthcare policy look at the number of policy decisions that were made based on his data that is what we call as uh policy driven research it's, it's the, the the community at large is benefiting from the results of the research that they did the government has formulated policies laws acts based on the information that was collected so that is that is what we call as translational research which benefits the society at large even if you do a small piece of research always think about it that how it is going to add to the existing knowledge how it is going to help my patients how it is going to help community how it is going to help largely society how it is going to help planet for that matter it could be related to environment on something like that so the research that we do it should not because sometimes that it's for the sake of doing research like a repetitive research somebody has already answered that question we still you know continue to do that so in that context i say that whenever we identify a research question look at from this perspective the utility and application in the context of the society and human beings thank you good very good question thank you, thank you for asking that anybody else yes yes please so we have another two three we can we can afford only one or two more questions so please raise your hand if you want to ask questions um hello everyone so my question i'm nidip joshi from simbasis school of biological sciences and i'm pursuing my masters in biotechnology 
Um, so um, from this discussion, I just wanted to ask one question. So I firmly believe that like research should be cultivated when a person when a person is young, like during school or something, like right from the ability to ask right questions, that's what I rightly mentioned. So my question is, where do we exactly lack when, um, when while developing that research aptitude? Because when it comes to India, the amount of researchers we produce are quite less in um, in current um, day and age. So as compared to other nations of the world. So my question is, where do we exactly lack in that young phase wherein we can nurture our, um, when we can nurture those minds and like inculcate that, at least that in, um, ability to ask any question. I won't say right or wrong, but any question that because um, I know my cousins who don't ask questions, like they like come to me and say like, "Bhaiya, please explain this to me." And I'm like, "Ask this to your teacher." So why can't the um, why can't like we? inculcate that research aptitude right from school to ask the right questions and where do we not only from the uh, educational institute point of view but we as the society lack in asking good, the right questions. Very good question. question. So you know traditionally our education system right from nursery until post graduation is the teacher asks a question and you are supposed to give an answer right that's the traditional method of teaching throughout our teaching experience. I, so I'm going to give an example of a real life thing that happened with me and perhaps it may be a repetition for those of you all who attend, attended the previous one. Uh, my children were very small. They were about three, four, five, third, fourth, fifth, sixth standard. And uh, summer vacation, I used to come home for lunch. I had only a period of 20 minutes to have my lunch peacefully. And uh, because they had school holidays, the, all the neighboring, the neighbor students used to come to our house and make a lot of noise, full tamasha. They used to shout, scream, run, hit each other and so on. Uh, very spontaneously, I collected all these students together and I said, come on guys, let's play a game. Okay, this is standard three, four, five, six, seven. So all the kids sat in front of me and I said, uh, we'll, we'll play a very interesting game. So they got very excited. Uncle is going to play a game with us. I then gave them a piece of paper and a pencil. And I said, this game is about asking questions. I am going to show you an object. And based on that object, you have to ask as many questions as you possibly can. And the child who asks the most number of questions and the most interesting questions will get a prize. So they said, uncle, do we have to give answers to those questions? And I said, no, you don't have to give answers to those questions. You only have to give, ask questions. The game is about asking questions. So I removed the pen from my pocket and I said, this is the object for today's game. You get 15 minutes. During that time, I'm going to have my lunch. And during those 15 minutes, you're going to ask as many questions as you possibly can on the pen. The children started scratching their heads. And they started looking at each other. How many questions? Three questions? Four questions? Oh, competition. So they said, Uncle, you have never played a game like this. We have only played the game of answering, giving answers. Never played a game of asking questions. At the end of 15 minutes, when I collected those papers from those kids, I got a shock of my life. When I read those questions that these small kids had asked about the pen, if you find answers to those questions, you take the pen to a different level. Yeah. This is the beginning of innovation. This is the beginning of discovery. This is the power of asking questions. And sadly, our education system is just the other way around. Right. We are only expected to give answers. Right. So what we need to do right from our school days is encourage our youngsters, children, to learn to ask questions. Be inquisitive. The moment you're inquisitive, you start asking questions, that is when your mind starts becoming more creative. That's where innovation happens. That's where discoveries happen. So, you know, simple things like these now need to be inculcated in schools. Maybe there should be a competition in every school. There should be a competition in the class. Show an object and say, ask as many questions as you possibly can on this. You don't have to give any answers. Only ask questions. So I think that mindset needs to change in all our education curriculum. Right. So 
uh, I think that's, that's, that's how important it is. And you've raised a very, very important issue. It's about fundamental change in our education system. Sir, you want to add something to that? Uh, responded to the question and uh, I would encourage you to attend tomorrow's talk uh, by ma'am on catch them young. You will have many answers out of that talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think, uh, can we give a big round of applause to our wonderful faculty? And uh, you know, you have been such a wonderful audience, very receptive. I could see all of you all were paying attention to everything that was being said. And thank you for those wonderful questions that you all asked. I think absolutely brilliant. And thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful contribution to this, uh, to this wonderful masterclass. <laughs> thank you so much.